Hello, and welcome back to the Two Stewards Show with Brent. And Mark. Welcome. Yeah, and it's nice to have you here. And today we're going to continue our series talking about why real estate. Um, we've been going through some of the reasons why real estate is a preferred investment over other kinds of investments and what advantages real estate has to people um, as an investment class. So today, I think the first thing we want to talk about is the reason third party pay down. And that's on my list here. So Mark, give us an idea. How does third party pay down? What does that even mean? First of all, and <laughs> how does real estate allow us to leverage that to our advantage? Yeah. So we, last time we talked about leverage, we talked about cash flow, and, uh, yeah, we're getting to third party pay down. So this just means that somebody else is paying down your mortgage. Yeah, so it seems you... pretty easy. Let's go to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, done. Um, but yeah, you, if you have an investment property, uh, we talked about the importance of cash flow, but let's say you're not cash flowing. You're just, you're making $0 a month on that property. Um, even if you did that over, let's say you have a 30 year mortgage over 30 years, somebody else is going to pay down that property for you. So that the, somebody is. Oh, that would be a tenant. The tenants. Yeah. The ten, yeah. Yeah. I guess we don't need, it doesn't need to be a mystery. It's your tenants. <laughs> so that's kind of, kind of interesting to think about, right? You, you put up the initial uh, cash for that property and then, yeah, let's say it doesn't make money. You know, hope it, it should, but at the end of that 30 years, that property is yours free and clear, you didn't do anything. I mean, you, you probably did some work in terms of maintenance and, and finding tenants and so forth. But um, what other thing can you get that hopefully produces cash flow along the way, hopefully increases in value, and you get to keep at the end because somebody else paid for it? It's pretty incredible and powerful, in, uh, in my opinion. Yeah, what jumps into my head is... Uh... When you talk about third party pay down, somebody else paying for your asset as being a tenant, well, the importance of finding a good tenant mm -hmm. um, and attracting the right tenant, um, because a lot of the deals we're doing, um, we're doing significant renovations, obviously, we're going and we're buying something, we're putting in, um, you know, good quality units, legal units, trying to attract a good tenant, because that is the third party that's going to be paying off our mortgage over time and buying that asset on our behalf. So um, to me, that that also speaks to how you treat them. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, we talked about maybe tenants are customers, right? There's a business in a box. The tenant is the, the one who's um, paying your bills. And uh, yeah, you have to treat them with respect, treat them like uh, they are your customer, right? Like it's a bit of a service and you probably have that in your, your business too, right? Like a service oriented industry toward the tenant, I guess. Yeah. Your, your side of it, like they're <laughs> guests, right? They're not just. Yeah. Like, this is, yeah. It's a hotel mindset. So you have guests coming all the time. With Airbnb, in, right? In you do short Airbnbs. Term, uh, or even midterm rentals. Um, they're, you know, different, uh, different kind of guests for the two, but yeah, it's still, um, yeah, they're, they're customers, they're guests and you're hosting them. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. You have to, you're catering to them a little bit. And yeah. even from, um, you know, just on a, like from a Christian perspective, if you're providing housing to someone, this is, you know, a little bit more on the long-term side, um, you know, that's, that's a different matter again, right? And you need to provide like you should anyways, but especially from that perspective, you need to provide safe housing where quality. somebody, yeah, quality where somebody can live and, you know, live with a little bit of dignity and safety and security, um, all things that, that you should be providing. Um, yeah. So I've heard it been said too, like the, uh, for a little, just for a little bit of a perspective, like, you know, every day your tenants wake up and they go to work and they end up paying you like could be 30%, um, even more sometimes, right. Of their paycheck goes to pay for your house. So, um, over the course of, you know, a tenancy or over the course of owning that property, maybe for 10, 20 years, those numbers start to add up and they're huge. Mm -hmm. Um, and where did that money come from? Well, it just came from their, um, you know, their labor. 
So, um, yeah, it's, it's good to, um, be reminded by that. It's kind of humbling, right. To think, you know, um, you're really a servant to them. They're obviously paying for your asset, but the only way you can own the asset is, um, through their work and their, um, living in it. Right. So, um, yeah, it is humbling. Definitely. Um, cause, um, what other asset class, cause we're really talking about the difference between real estate and other, uh, investments like in stock investing, other types of investing, um, even starting a business, where does the money come from on those businesses? Like in stock mm -hmm. investing, you know, who's paying, <laughs> who's paying for your <laughs> stocks? <laughs> you don't have a tenant necessarily no. you know, buying you stocks or paying you dividends on it. Um, I guess you would say they're, um, you know, that the companies that you buy, if they pay dividends, then maybe the company itself is profitable and they're paying out of those profits to you. But they're never um, going to pay down. No, they're never going to pay down the debt. Yeah. Your initial investment. No. That, that you put in, that'll never get paid down. Hopefully it'll increase. And the difference between, you know, the value then and the, what you've put in is, is, is greater, but yeah, it's not something that somebody can use or that you can, you know, you can lend out and you get into, again, some of the options and stuff. You could lend out your stock, uh, but again, that's a whole. It's a very high degree of sophistication and uh, high degree of risk as well. Yeah, and even um, if you buy your own or start your own business, and you're trying to um, pay down the money that you used to start the business in the first place, usually that comes out of profits from your endeavor, right? Like if you're going yes. out and you're making some money at the end of the day, you you take a bit of that and you put it aside to pay down, you know, maybe your capital costs to buy your you know, lawnmower to start a lawn mowing business or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and generally, yeah, maybe you're saving up money in the first place to buy the lawnmower. But if you're trying to expand and grow, you're using, using debt to do that. Yep. Um, you're going to pay that debt back with profits. Um, whereas in real estate, um, we have this kind of built in mechanism. That's kind of unique, right? The third party pay down to having tenants to pay for the debt that you yes. need to borrow to buy it. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible when you think about it that way. So maybe the next thing on our list here is price appreciation. So what exactly does that refer to? <laughs> so that's a hot topic lately. You know, and you hear people talking about the housing bubble has burst. Shouldn't and it be price depreciation or? Yeah, maybe. So when we're looking at real estate investing, we're generally taking a long-term approach, even if we're investing in short-term uh, rental units, uh, short or midterm rental, like, like I do, um, it's still a long-term view because Investment, you're still holding right? that, you're still holding that asset over the long period or you should anyways. And if you're not, um, then you really got to rethink, you know, why am I investing in real estate? It is meant to be a longer term, uh, like a buy and hold type investment. And the reason is because there are fluctuations in the market and, you know, we've had some extreme examples of that in the last few years. So we had prices increase just ridiculous amounts, 20, 30% per year, which is, um, yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's not healthy. It's unsustainable um, as well, right? Yeah. And it's, it's not sustainable. And then we've seen now a reduction in price of, you know, up to 30% in uh, kind of where we are. So you've had houses uh, like bungalows going for up to a million dollars and now they're maybe in the $700,000 range. Um, and people will look at this and say like, see, and it's, it's all crashing down, but you know, let's go back a few years. Um, it's still up over the, you know, in the, even yeah. in the short term, in the long term, absolutely. It's up. If we go back 10 years, that same house might've been worth 250 or $300,000. So it's more than doubled in that time frame, And, um, even, you know, yeah, over the last three, yeah, cases. tripled in some cases. And that's with, with the recent downturn. So when, when we're looking at the value um, of real estate, we really shouldn't be looking at in two year increments, right? 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Yeah. That should be the length of time you're holding. To me, this assets. is not really necessarily a feature of um, that. That's, that seems unique. Uh, on the investment landscape, like price appreciation is kind of something you would find in various different investments, mm -hmm. right? Like, um, <clears throat> even if like, let's say you're buying collectibles, like you collect watches or fancy cars or 
you know, um, art, uh, you're buying it, anticipating that, like, because it's a rare thing, it's going to appreciate in price over time. Um, you know, different other types of stock investing or whatever you're buying it based on the idea that when you sell it, it will be worth more. Um, so it's kind of just real estate has that feature as well. And the way that's the way I look at this. Um, it does. Like, when, Is there when something we're... unique about price appreciation when it comes to real estate? Maybe it's the fact that the market has all these underlying fundamentals that you can kind of predict. And Well, it's because it's housing and people will always need housing. People don't always need, uh, like there's a lot Fancy of things watch. we can go without uh, before we get down to housing, right? You can go without housing, I suppose, and live under a bridge, but it's a fundamental um, need that we have in uh in our society and like in canada it's cold so mm -hmm. you don't want to be living outside in the winter um and yeah i mean joking aside it's we need housing so that's it's if you can invest in something that people will always need probably is going to be a good investment but i just wanted to say when we're kind of evaluating a deal for a customer they're looking at buying a house and is this going to be a suitable um you know midterm rental or a short-term rental um, we always kind of caution them that like, don't take price appreciation into account. We're going to look at the deal based on cash flow, and if it works that way, uh, you know, a number of other things, but if those things all work out, then we'll count price appreciation as a bonus, but just because there can be some volatility and there can be, you know, it could be a five-year stretch where maybe the house doesn't increase in value. And, you know, anybody who's invested in real estate in the last like gotten into it in the last 10 years is like, what are you talking about? No, it's going to yeah. go up ridiculous. But, you know, go back 30 years, you'll see, you still see that there's steady appreciation, but not on the order of 10 or 20% a year, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, price appreciation is really the icing on the cake when you're yeah. looking at all the factors of why to buy an investment property. Um, it has to pay for itself. Yeah. Otherwise, I can't continue to own it. And oh, uh, by the way, they're paying down, like the tenant is paying down my debt. Yep. So that's where you're getting a lot of your um, uh, benefit. And then the price appreciation, is, appreciation at the end of it is just the icing on the cake at the end yeah. when you sell. <clears throat> um, that's maybe something too to touch on is how do you actually realize those gains? Um, like in real estate, you actually have to sell or I guess you could refinance the property to actually access that money because if your property goes up in value over time um, you really don't have that money whereas we talked about income and cash flow like that money comes in to the bank account because the tenant pays the rent and you have excess cash flow that money is in your bank right mm -hmm. and you can spend it um, on whatever but with equity they always say you can't eat equity like you can't <laughs> you can't live off of uh, equity in real estate so yeah absolutely <clears throat> Which is again why cash flow is so important, right? And why we like the short term model because of the increased cash flow that can, uh, you know, you can eat that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you're right. Equity by itself doesn't mean anything. And uh, yeah, if you sell that house, generally you're going to be exposed to capital gains taxes. Um, so, and yeah, depending on. Not necessarily a bad thing because it means you made money, but. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But uh, to me, you always want to hold on to an asset like this. Like you never want to get rid of it, even, you know, till you die. And there's ways to, um, to structure things so that there's not a horrendous amount of taxes or that you can mitigate the taxes when you do pass away and hopefully pass the real estate on to your children. Um, but the, the, the big tool that we normally use, and this is kind of the next point, I talk about um, the infinite piggy bank. Um, and, you know, people will say like, yeah, you shouldn't use your investments as a piggy bank. That's terrible. Like, how could you do that? Um, I think that's, that's the equity that you can eat. So that's when you would do a refinance of the property. So, okay, so that's the fifth. Um, yeah, that's kind of the here. fifth yeah. reason for buying real estate is uh, the ability to refinance and take money out tax-free subject to certain limitations, right? Generally, if you're taking money out of an investment property that should be used for business purposes to remain tax-free. Um, and I know not everybody does that, but uh, just kind of keep that 
<clears throat> excuse me, keep that in mind, but you can take chunks of money out of that house to, uh, to finance what you need to finance or to do what you want to do with it and um, still keep the asset. So when we're talking about a refinance, that means we're going to go to the bank and say, hey, I bought this house for you know $500,000. It's worth a million dollars now. Uh, I would like to take some of the equity out. So I would like to get a new mortgage with you at a bigger like a bigger mortgage and um, the difference in the value of the house and the value of that new mortgage is what I'm going to take in cash. So this concept is really just talking about accessing the increased equity from price appreciation. So reason yep. number four, price appreciation, um, you bought something and went up in value and now there's all that value sitting there on the table. How am I accessing that? And what am I doing with that when I do access it? Um, because, you know, for some people, they want to invest to achieve a goal. Maybe that goal is to go on a vacation mm -hmm. or maybe that goal is to retire uh, early or may maybe that goal is to have money in retirement, which is probably good. Um, but yeah, if you if you all of a sudden sell it and realize that goal, um, you have the option to spend that money on, you know, something that you enjoy or mm -hmm. you can reinvest that. And that's what you're talking about, right? With um, with getting into um, accessing your equity to buy another investment. Yeah. And that the power of how you can borrow money out of your property to buy another property um, makes growth happen a lot faster. It speeds up the whole process. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's kind of the path for, for real estate investors, right? Cause you only have so much cash generally speaking well in time, time. <laughs> <laughs> so if you can uh yeah if you can use that increased equity and it makes sense right you still want a cash flow now there's two ways to look at that right you can say well i only want to take out enough or only take out an amount from this this house uh b we'll call it so house a is your primary residence house b would be your first investment property now you want to buy house c so i'm going to take out enough to cover the down payment for house C, but not so much that I am now negative cash flow on house B. And yeah, because when you do access the money from the first house, like house mm -hmm. B, I guess, yeah, your loan will go up. Yeah, so you're going to pay an increased amount um, in uh, in mortgage payments. <clears throat> so two ways to look at it: one is maintain a good, consistent cash flow in house B. And then buy house C and then get cash flow there as well. The second way is to look at it on a more por portfolio level. So even though it's just two houses, it's still a portfolio. So you could say, I'm going to take my cash flow from house B and kill it or put it down to zero. But on house C, I'm going to have increased cash flow again. So when you look at the portfolio overall, it's still cash flowing in, in, in a healthy position. So, you know. There's a lot of variables and different things that you should look at when you're doing that. But those are kind of two different yeah. ways. So how to... is that um, like this infinite piggy bank concept of reborrowing equity from your house or your investment property to buy another one different than investing in other things? Like if you're investing in stocks, is this is this an option for you? Like, can you borrow against the value of your stocks? Not and... generally. Right. If you're you a high net worth to? individual and you've got maybe some private banking, then there's more options available to you. So the people yeah, that we're, we're probably kinda... not talking to those people, <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> the people that are probably listening to us are, uh, are not those people, <laughs> right? The people who are definitely <laughs> listening to us are probably not the people flying on private jets around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, when you're, when you're in that position to be in high net worth and you've got private banking, there's a lot of other options available to you. We're not talking about them. We're talking about regular folks who are just trying to do a bit better for their family and, you know, buy that first house, maybe get the second one. So, and when we talk about sort of the infinite piggy bank, you can repeat this process as much as you, as often as you want. Now that's assuming that you have equity built up in the property. So if it's not growing in value just because of, you know, the real estate market or inflation, you still have that third party pay down we talked about. So it's going to be a slower pace. It's whatever the mortgage is getting paid down by each year um, by your tenants that will give you that increased um, 
pot of cash that you can take out. Generally speaking, there is price appreciation, and that's going to, um, to yeah, to give you a bigger pool of money that you can pull out to um, yeah. To, so this to is really nice just property. as opposed to um, saving up the money yourself or using your own income source. Um, going to work every day to save up enough money to buy another rental property or your first one or whatever, you're actually using equity that's built up by the tenants paying down your mortgage and by yes. the property value increasing yep. to um, to buy something. So I just wanted to jump back because with the th uh, third party pay down, I guess when you say pay down, like we're really referring to principal pay down, right? Like yeah. Um, so I think it's a good to touch on the difference. Like when you pay a mortgage, um, how is it broken down? We have principal, we have interest. So every mortgage, when you get a, when you get a loan from the bank, um, they, they do front load it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you're paying more interest up front and as you go down, you pay less, but, um, you know, that principal payment is paying off the loan and that money goes into your pocket, so to speak. Um, and it's only accessible if you sell the property um, down the road. But um, yeah, it's your it's your loan, it's your house, and it's your money, right? So yeah, I don't know if there's anything else to talk about with that. But yeah, well, that, that's another reason to kind of have a longer term view and, and like a buy and hold approach to real estate because yeah, you're paying mostly interest in the first few years. Right. If you look at the uh, actual schedule of amortization. And then, you know, once you're into year five, year 10, now you're paying heftier amounts of actual principal on that mortgage. So if you sell in year one, your you, mortgage may not have decreased that much at all. Yeah. And then those are available from your bank. You could ask, usually you can, you can ask for them and get them or just kind of look it up. Um, just Google it. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, yeah, you're right. That's, um, that's something to keep in mind. All right. Do you want to jump in? So we touched on leverage and income in the previous episode. We talked on third party pay down, price appreciation, the infinite piggy bank, anything else in that? Or do you want to jump right into inflation and using inflation to your advantage? So, yeah, we should we should talk about inflation because that kind of touches on a lot of these things. This is a, this is a pretty uh, in-depth topic, actually. Right. People kind of think of inflation as just part of our economy, like part, it's part of life. Yeah. Things go up in price and that's just how it works. Right. So <laughs> diving into that, like, why is that? Why is it that things go up in price? Like what, <laughs> what causes that? Right. So <laughs> I, I don't know if we even want to get into that, but using inflation to your advantage. So there's a couple of ways to look at this. Um, you know, one way is that, yeah, if I have a house and we're talking about price appreciation, um, the inflation, and I'm doing air quotes here, inflation causes your house to be worth more every year because the price or the value of the house increases. And I mean, I, really, I got to say, that's not true. It's the value of your dollars decreasing. But as long as the asset that you have kind of outpaces the decrease in the value of your dollars. And we'll, we'll get into that um, a little bit more, but as long as that happens then you're doing okay. So really um, this could be a huge episode. Why don't we save it for the next time? The last reason you had is superior returns for regular investors. All right. I don't know if we can just use this one to wrap it up and then we'll jump into inflation next time because <laughs> Yeah, maybe that's a good idea because there's a whole bunch of foundations we need to kind of lay for uh, for talking about inflation. But um, yeah, suffice it to say that uh, your house goes up in value. That's a, a great way to to use inflation. And also the debt that you have, the mortgage goes down in value, um, not just through paying it off, but through inflation, right? If, inflate, if the value of your dollars decreases, the value of your debt also decreases. So we'll leave it at that for the inflation portion. Uh, but yeah, the last reason was superior returns for regular investors. And that's kind of a, um, a composite of a lot of the things that we've talked about already. We've explained, you know, through leverage, through income, third party pay down, price appreciation, refinancing and inflation, which we'll touch on more. 
um, why all those things are powerful tools for real estate um, and for regular folks to invest in real estate. When you add that all up and you just do the numbers, real estate always outperforms. So I've done yeah. calculations based on, you know, the S and P 500 over 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. Um, real estate has always beaten an, a, a simple stock investment. And I'm just talking about you, you're going to take X amount of money <clears throat> and invest it in the stock market. So let's say it's a hundred grand. Uh, you can put that in the stock in the S and P 500 and you know, that has shown about a 10% return over the last 50 years, pretty steady. Like it's, it's up and down, but in the long haul. So again, buying stocks should probably be a longer term buy and hold thing. Uh, whereas real estate will always outperform that. And the reason is because you're not just relying on price appreciation. You've got all these other things mm -hmm. that are increasing the value of your investment and decreasing the amount of debt that you have, um, initially paid for that investment and uh um, yeah so i haven't on my end i haven't done all these calculations but um maybe a little story because from personal experience um so when i first got into this whole thing i uh i bought a property back this is 2014 and um my first uh exposure to all of these kind of concepts came about a year after i bought the property because i uh, when, when about a year in, I guess, after I got the annual mortgage statement in the mail. So you get like CIBC, we had a loan with CIBC. They would send you this annual mortgage statement. I had no idea I was going to get this, mm -hmm. but um, I hadn't taken a step back after a year of owning this property and renting it out that, um, you know, what the numbers actually were. So I got this letter in the mail and it gives you a month by month breakdown and then a total at the end of the year saying like, you know, what, uh, you paid in, uh, I think it was life insurance. There was a little piece of that. I got rid of that later. And then there was interest on mm -hmm. the loan. And then there was the principal. And lo and behold, it's like $9,000 of principal. I think at the time, yeah, it was $9,000 of principal that had been paid down over the course of that year by the tenant. And, uh, you know, I looked at the bank account for the property and it had you know, positive cash flow in there. And then I get this statement in the mail and I'm like, whoa, <laughs> how many hours would I have to work uh -huh. at my day job at the time? I don't know what I was making. Like, you know, you're out of school, you go get a job and whatever entry level salary. And I kind of calculated out as like, this is not feasible. Like I, there's no way I could work this many hours and get that much return. Mm -hmm. So why, how, like, how, how can this be <laughs> right? Like it, 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 out, it outperformed my own labor and ingenuity and my job and all this stuff. And I was just taken aback. I was like, okay, hey, that's a light bulb moment. And how do I get more of these and how do I help other people see this and, and get more of them? And, and then I kind of got into real estate investing and, and learned a lot more. But at that time it was just like, how can you save this money this quickly? You can't. And this is, like you said, it's superior returns for regular investors. It's, it's a return that you're going to get that, um, you know, you can't get in other assets the same way. And there's so many benefits to like, you know, the fact that I could go there and I can meet the tenants, I could see the place, I could cut the grass if I wanted, mm -hmm. I could fix it up a little bit. Uh, if the tenants move out, I could raise the rent a little bit, like all these little things they start adding up. And when you look at every reason we've kind of listed, and you realize all you got to do is just find the right property and buy it and own it for a long period of time. Um, yeah, the benefits are huge. So yeah, that's, that's my little story. But <laughs> that's, no, that's a perfect, uh, perfect story to, to illustrate that. Like you don't have to be a rocket scientist to invest in real estate. Yeah, it's within reach. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I heard somebody say, I don't know if I've said this here before, but I'll repeat it, that there's more... Um, rich, dumb investors in real estate than any <laughs> other market segment. And, uh, you know, having talked to a lot of real estate investors, it's true. <laughs> but the point is, you don't need to be a genius. Like, like us. 
I mean, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm assuming you weren't a genius when you no. bought that first house, right? And when we, far, far, our... I didn't even know what the building code was. Yeah, what's a building code? Yeah. So here I am doing renovations, like screwing two by fours to the drywall. Like, I don't know what I'm doing, right? But I know the concept is I have to get people to rent this thing out. So yeah, um, that starts your journey and there's a lot you can build and grow on it. But um, yeah. it was the same story for us when we bought our first investment property. Like we weren't thinking about real estate or in real estate terms. We were just like, yeah, like it should work. You know, we'll see. And, um, and yeah, it absolutely did. So for the regular person, yeah, it's within reach because your other options for investing are typically stocks, start your own business. Um, you can do a side hustle, but yeah, when you kind of add up, you know, you want to, I don't know what's a good side hustle. Um, so you could work more basically, right? If you yeah. want to increase your Which income, so you maybe... could do Uber, like do Uber, or yeah. DoorDash or something, right? And you kind of look at, okay. And that was part of the light bulb for me was I got this mortgage statement and see all the principal that's been paid down by somebody else. And then I'm like, you know, I didn't do anything. No. Like I went there once in a while and I would check on, I would answer phone calls or whatever, but I really didn't put in much time. No. And the trade-off for like the time versus the reward. Um, and it wasn't like they paid me the principal it was, it was still in equity. Like I would have to sell the house to access it, but mm -hmm. I'm just like, if I did sell the house, um, you know, the equity was there and, um, you know, let's not even talk about the price appreciation and, um, the cash flow for a minute, but yeah, just the, the principal pay down on that. Yeah. Um, so if you were just saving for your retirement, trying to put yeah. work, do an extra job, put that money aside, this beats that any day of the week. Yeah. So maybe let's wrap it up there and uh, we'll jump into inflation next time. Absolutely. Thanks for listening, folks. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Two Stewards Show. If you like my voice better, click subscribe. And if you like my voice better, click share. If you like both, give us a five-star rating. To interact with the show, feel free to reach out at hello at twostewards.ca. We'll see you in the next episode. In the meantime, steward your wealth wisely. Thank you.